ಸದ್ಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ವೆರಿ ವಾಮ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಿ ಕನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡಿಂಗ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೀಕೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ವೀಕೆಂಡ್ ವಿತ್ ವಿಸ್ಡಮ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ವೆರಿ ಗ್ಲಾಡ್ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಚಿದಾನಂದಾಜಿ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಮುಂಬೈ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಅಗೇನ್ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಫಾರ್ ಮೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಸೆಷನ್ ಸೊ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಎಸ್ಟರ್ಡೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆನ್ ಪರ್ಸ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿನೆಸ್ uh from a vedantic perspective uh, he spoke yesterday uh, he gave a shed light on a great many insights uh, from taittiriya upanishad and many other uh, uh, vedantic texts and uh, he spoke about manushya ananda and and he spoke about how there are more greater magnitudes of ananda as well uh, so but before we begin uh, let me start with a small prayer sada shiva samarambham shankara charya madhyamam asmada charya paryantam vande guru paramparam vakratunda mahakaya koti surya samaprabha nirvignam kuru me deva ಸರ್ವಕಾರ್ಯು ಸರ್ವಮಂಗಳಮಾಂಗಲ್ಯೆ ಶಿವೆ ಸರ್ವಾಥ ಸಾಧಿಕೆ ಶರಣ್ಯ ತ್ರಯಂಬಕೆ ಗೌರಿ ನಾರಾಯಣಿ ನಮೋಸ್ತು ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಗೋ ಹೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ದ ಸೆಷನ್ you have to unmute yourself yes yeah namaste everyone and we are going to continue our search for happiness the topic is the search for happiness and all of us agree on one point at least that above all we desire happiness it is said that somebody went to a great rishi and said i want happiness show me the way and the rishi said please say again in simple english what is it you want the visitor said i want happiness the rishi said remove want remove i what remains is happiness only apart from playing with words this episode has an interesting teaching and vedanta goes much into that in our experience of sorrow in our experience of for that matter of fear and many other negativities the crux of the matter is there are desires represented by the word want the visitor said i want happiness want means desires and then there is also i i that is egoism so i me and my called the ahankara is also the major player in our being unhappy being afraid and so on happiness is so elusive all around the world it is difficult to find even a single person with what you may call lasting happiness single person who can claim i am happy all the time i have no problems at all other day there was a interesting piece i read a man went to buy a sofa and the shopkeeper said i'll show you a new model of the sofa we have and the shopkeeper showed showed the sofa he said this sofa can accommodate 
can easily accommodate five people without any problem. The customer looked at that sentence differently. The customer said, say again. The shopkeeper said, this sofa can comfortably accommodate five people without any problems. The customer said, in this world, it's difficult to find even one person without any problem. You want me to get five people without any problem and you say the sofa can accommodate them? This is a joke in English language. Why the shopkeeper meant the sofa can without any problem accommodate. The customer thought he had designed that sofa for five people, people having no problem. Anyway, let's come back. I must quickly share with you a well-known story with regard to happiness. Very briefly, we are not here to tell stories. Therefore, let me be brief. In Jnana Yoga, lesser the stories, lesser the jokes, lesser the examples, lesser the linguistic decorations, better it is. Because in Jnana Yoga, in looking for right understanding, we don't want to get distracted by linguistic decorations, poetry, humor, etc. Seriously speaking, can cause either a distraction or a certain illusory idea that we understood it. We may not have understood at all. We may have liked the story. The story might have delighted us. Therefore, very briefly, it seems a king had some unbearable back pain and no medicine worked. And then a very wise man said to the king, your back pain will go if you wear the shirt of a truly happy man. And the king's people searched for a happy man. First they thought the prime minister might be supremely happy because he's so intelligent. They thought the army general could have been happy and so on. But all of them confessed, confessed in privacy that we really are not happy. We have so much sorrow in our life. And then the story ends with soldiers going in the four directions. And they do find a certain man in the jungle sitting below a tree singing some song and when they asked him uh, we have heard that you are truly happy are you indeed happy all the time the man said of course i am very happy all the time i have no worries at all and the soldier said please give us your shirt if our king wears your shirt his backache will be gone and the story ends with an irony. That happy man under the tree in the jungle had no shirt at all. Anyhow, stories at our end generally end on a happy note. The moment they found that man who was truly happy 24 by 7, back in the palace, the king's back pain vanished. So these are good to take note of the fact that hardly anyone is happy. Yesterday there was a good question. Someone said and it made me think even in the evening. The question was, why not we just settle for Manu Why not we settle for the best possible human happiness? Why go for the happiness of Devas, happiness of Gandharvas, happiness of Indra, Brahaspati, and finally what Vedanta talks about, the happiness of Brahmajnana. Now, I answered saying, surely, those of us who are content with the Manusha Ananda may as well go for just that. But to look at it again, Manusha Ananda he is of a young man who is enjoying good health, who is intelligent, who is in good shape, as we say. 
Uh, that's very good. But as we know, and as Prince Siddhartha had discovered uh, before he went away to do tapas, in human life, nobody can save himself from old age, from disease, from death, and so on. There was a man who got old, got older. He was living with his granddaughter, nobody else at home. And this man one day was opening the door of some cupboard and it was making screeching sound. Every time he opened the door, it made some sound. A short video clip which came over WhatsApp to me some time back. Some of you might have got it also. Every time he pulls the door to open the cabinet, it was making a screeching sound. He put some oil. He tried very many ways to stop that sound. It would not stop. Then his granddaughter noticed that the grandfather was struggling with something. She said, let me check. When she opened the door and again closed, she opened the door again closed. There was no sound at all. Then in this humorous video, it may not be really true. The granddaughter says, Grandpa, let me check. She moves his hand back and forth. And when his hand was moving back and forth, there was this screeching sound. The screeching sound was coming from the movement of his hand, not from the opening or and closing of the cabinet. Anyway, joke, joke apart, you and I will suffer not only from old age, from disease, but also from people misunderstanding us, people not treating us well and so on. Vivekananda was going on a ship and he meets a young man in a story that is well recorded. And Vivekananda, in a friendly tone, asks that young man, where are you going? The young man says, I am going abroad. What will you get by going abroad? I will have a better standard of living. I will earn better. And after that, what? There's a long sequence. He says, I'll marry a very nice young woman. I'll have children. I will have a big house. After that, what? After that, what? And then the young man realizes that all of these come and go. All of these no more give happiness after a certain point of time. Therefore, all said and done, there is happiness in being healthy, loving our work and so on, but everything has certain limitations. So in the present context of our topic, with due respect to a lot of places and other, other settings where there is happiness, we don't deny happiness in uh, regular life. With all due respect to that, the Vedanta, the Upanishads ask us to go on a quest. Upanishads ask us to go for a search for lasting happiness and infinite happiness. It may look very conceptual, it may look just philosophical, it may look abstract, but though one in a million, we have had saints and sages who have confirmed that what the Upanishads talk about is possible. So in the world, there is a lot of confusion also about this business of enlightenment, about moksha, about liberation and Kundalini rising. So many ways it is expressed in the Hindu religion, in the Vedanta, and abroad also. So, let's get back to how Upanishads look at this quest for happiness. Yesterday also I said, Upanishads do respect various other things we may do to increase the length of 
our being happy, to increase the intensity of our happiness. Karma, bhakti, yoga, and various permutations and combinations of all these. I want to share with you now one more dimension of how we may find happiness. As per our Shastras, which culminate in Vedanta. You see, karma khanda, rituals, puja, and various upasanas, which have their own forms of meditation, all of them are not literally contrary to Vedanta. They are like the lower levels of a pyramid. We have karma, we have upasana, and then we have jnana. Brahma jnana, the understanding of the highest reality. So what I want to share with you is, at places Adi Shankaracharya has written this, and it is found in certain Upanishad mantras too, that happiness is actually the result of punya that we had performed, we had earned before. In a previous life or in present life itself, you and I do some meritorious act. To do Namasmarana is meritorious. Just yesterday I advised uh, a lady who has been into spirituality and yet she is not at peace. She gets quite annoyed and agita agitated over things that are happening around her. And she said, what do I do about these people who constantly get on my nerve? So I wrote back to her in the message that, look, you can't change them. They are what they are. But I can tell you one thing. Since she also was a uh, student of Sanskrit, I wrote to her the sutra for happiness. Punya sanchayam puru. Punya sanchayam puru means puru means go for, do. Punya sanchayam. Collect more punya. Collect more punya. Because the shastras say if we have collected punya, then whether we want it or not, there will be moments of happiness, periods of happiness. And to her I explicitly said, mm -hmm. because she also complained of having no time for any sadhana nowadays. Life has taken such a twist and turn in her life that there is hardly any time. No time to do sadhana. Then I said to her, you can earn punya. Punya means religious merit. Why? Constantly remembering God while doing any work that you anyhow are doing. You and I complain that I have so much work to do. It's true. We are not telling a lie. We are not telling a lie. We do have work. A long list of things to do. It can be stressful and it leaves us exhausted, agitated. But we must recognize that in the work we do, there are two parts. One is how the body and mind get tired because of the work itself. Another is our mind gets very tired very depressed sometimes, very lonely sometimes, very distracted sometimes. You know why? Not because of the work, because of so many other thoughts. Somebody rightly said, many so-called depressing situations do not depress you by themselves. They depress you because of your psychological resistance to them. Our reaction to what happens around us. Somebody comes to us and says, you are a fool. Somebody calls us a fool. Okay, he has done his job. But in my mind, suppose there is a reaction. I want to punch him on his face. I want to complain this to somebody. I want to ensure that he suffers. And this is not the first time he's doing. Like that, thoughts arise. Somewhere I also read 
In this world, some people get tired by work, but then there are some who get tired by the thought of work. By thinking about work, they get tired. So in various ways, there is a aspect called psychological mind. One is the functional mind. I need to, let's say, carry an object from place A to place B. I have a scooter. I sit on the scooter. I put the object or the packet safely in a box or store it in, on the vehicle. I go 10 kilometers, hand it over to somebody and I drive back. All that is functional. But psychological is, as I drive, why do they give such work to me only where others, they could have done? Why am I always taken advantage of? I'm not going to keep quiet at this and all these mental reactions. Therefore, we say, Punya can cleanse our mind. So to this lady, I said, while you do work, do Namasmatam. Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram. Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram. Or whichever. Now when you do Namasmarana, in the Shastras we say, there is Drishta as well as Adrishta Fala. Drishta is going by logic, going by reason, going by immediate experience. We see that when we hold on to name of God lovingly, we invoke that sentiment of devotion, the mind becomes quiet. Drishta is seen. We can see it. A drishta is where we have to believe in the Shastras. The Shastras say that names of God have something mystical about it. Therefore, Vishnu Sahasranama, Lalita Sahasranama, etc. have been very popular for ages. We don't know when they were first written down and so on. And each name is said to bring merit to us. Shankaracharya, in one of his commentaries on the Upanishad, says that sometimes a man could be extremely happy. Though he may not have eaten a good meal, he may not be wearing good clothes. Nobody came and praised him just a while ago. Nothing really happened which could make him happy. And he is very happy and he himself is surprised. He is sitting somewhere and says, I don't know, today I am so happy. Today I am so blissful. This is uh, surprising. The explanation given in the Shastras is, it is Punya Paka. Paka means ripening. Somewhere, sometime you had worshipped God. You had gone on a Tirtha Yatra. Dvadasha Jyotir Linga you visited. Somewhere you helped somebody. Somewhere you showed random gestures of kindness. An elderly man was finding it difficult to carry both his bags. You were just passing by. You said, Uncle, can I help you? And not just one of his bags. You took both the bags in your hands and helped him reach his home from the bus stop or from some railway station. You walked a kilometer with the old man with those bags. You gained punya. That was, let us say, in 2003. Now it is 2023. The laws of karma are very difficult for us to know. God runs the show. God has his ways in which the karma, which was performed in 2003, bears fruit. It is called ripening. It is called becoming prarabdha. So, prarabdha is what has begun. That is, the result of a certain karma has begun to show. Then, that karma is called prarabdha karma. So, punya sanchaya. Therefore, once more, before we reach the height of Brahmajnana, where without a cause, 
without cause effect relationship just by understanding your true nature happiness forever is with you that is the we may call it the quantum leap a thousand ways in which you and i can experience happiness are within the realm of gradation below and above lower and higher and they are to, to be precise both vertically and horizontally spread horizontally meaning i feel very happy eating some doklas and my sister is delighted to eat masala dosa dokla also is eatable masala dosa also is an eatable so they are all eatables of different kinds horizontally spread whereas vertical meaning my sister and i are happy if we get dokla or masala dosa but a cousin of ours is supremely happy when he gets time to listen to some classical music you my sister and i don't understand much classical music so in a manner of saying certain finer forms of happiness or finer forms of way to forms of ways to get happiness so vertically and horizontally there are thousands of factors which make us happy and the upanishads do respect but in this session we are focusing on what is that unique teaching of the upanishads therefore please let me say one last time there is no question of undermining or uh, for finding fault with the the 100 uh, other 1000 other ways of finding happiness even we the vedanta speakers do go for all those ways when we are tired of studying some vedanta some shastra we may open youtube video and watch some old song or old dance or something you know for the fun of it so we may go for some entertainment and that is not brahmajna but you know it gives us happiness food and drink and some music and dance we call some friend and talk to his friend a friend calls us don't we say sometimes at the end of the five minutes talk thank you for calling you made you made my day and so on there is happiness in a thousand things we respect it but this lecture is a vedanta perspective therefore the vedanta talks about everlasting happiness and in recent time in the last century bhagavan shri ramana maharshi was a shining example of somebody who anchored himself in brahma jnana there are there, there were many and there are many and sometimes some enlightened ones may go unnoticed somebody may be enlightened and he may be more misunderstood people may throw stones at him people may throw stones at her that's a different story but someone like shri ramana maharshi was a shining example and one of his works if i may extend my sources to ramana's works is sad darshanam in sad darshanam in the very first five or six verses he makes two statements he says in this world they talk about three entities jeeva individual soul ishvara the one ruler who controls everything in this created universe and then there is also the universe or the stage on which all this drama takes place arabhyate jeeva jagat paratma that's how a shloka begins jeeva jagat and paratma paratma is god in that shloka he says all that said and done finally supreme happiness is ours when in our consciousness in our awareness there is no 
ego left. Ego is basically a bundle of thoughts. And they asked Swami Chinmayanandi, what is ego? He said, oh, it is just a bundle of memories. You remember some insult that you suffered in 2018? You feel a little sad. You shrink inside. That is one facet, one phase of ego. And within five minutes, you remember another incident in 2014 where some people came and honored you. They heaped the praise upon you. And remembering that, another memory, please note, there is a sense of, I'm so good. See how they praised me, how they treated me well, how they honored me, how they felicitated me. Ah, I am a very good person. So two memories, an unpleasant memory makes you go down. A pleasant memory makes you rise in happiness. Swami Chinmayananji was so right. The ego in us, which at times is hurt, at other times feels, feels elated, is nothing but a bundle of memories. And when Maharshi Ramana in the shloka I cited says, Sarvottama Ahammati Shunya Nishta. Nishta means staying firmly in a certain alert awareness where Ahammati, Aham is Ahankar, Aham is ego, Mati is thought, Mati is mind, Mati is the notion, Ahammati, Aham Bhavana, Aham Bhavaha, Ahankaraha, all these are the same. So, Sarvottama Aham Mati Shunyanishtha. The greatest possible in human life is through wisdom, through right understanding, through inquiry, through contemplation on Upanishadic statements maybe, through whatever way, shall we say by hook or crook, shall we say beg, borrow or steal, but arrive at a state of being where you neither look at yourself as superior to others, nor look at yourself as inferior, a loser in life and so on. I am a loser, I am a winner, etc. are all mischief of the mind. A jnana nishta, somebody who is well established in Brahman, takes note of things. If he wins in some matter, he recognizes that from a certain angle of view, I am the winner today. But on a deeper level, I am not a winner, I am not a loser. I am the indescribable pure I. That is where Aham Brahmasmi is to be understood. Aham Brahmasmi, the statement of the Vedas, Vedanta from the Brahadarne Kopanishad, is not at all about developing some new superiority complex. I am Brahman and all others are not, he is utterly false. The understanding of Aham Brahma right away means everyone actually. Tom, Dick and Harry, Sita, Gita and Nita, all actually are Brahma. Aham Brahma is not some exclusive one person's achievement. It is recognition of the truth that Brahma alone is and I am no different from Brahma. Anyway, Sarvottama Ahammati Shunya Nishta. To quote one, one more, pretty much in the first five or six shlokas, Sri Ramana Maharshi says, in Saddarshanam, Sat means truth, Saddarshanam, Arabhyate, that we talk, Satyam Rishava, Pididam, Jadamva. There is a shloka starting with Satyam Rishava. Is this world, is this a creation true or is it false? Is it sentient? Sentient or is it jada? In this way, there is a lot of talk in this world, says Maharshi Ramana. But at the end of that shloka, he says, whatever they may be on your part, 
if you can stay without oscillations, without doubts, without confusions, without unnecessary wandering of the mind, if you can first train yourself to have a steady mind as far as possible, and then with that relatively steady mind, if you can go to the question, who am I? A transformation will take place in you. Therefore, the last part of the shloka says, Nishta avikalpa parama akhileshta. Parama akhila ishta. Ishta means desired. Ishta means desirable. What is most desirable? Most desired by all of us, while we may not recognize it generally, is we want to be really unburdened of any idea of who we are in terms of description. I am great, I am big, I am the boss here, is one form of nuisance. And I am the lowest employee in this organization. Everybody bosses over me, etc. is another noise in the mind. In Gavahara, in the functional world, in this day-to-day -day life where you and I have to take decisions, buy and sell and give and take, and when tired we need to rest, when hungry we need to eat, and hundred things you and I do till our last breath, till the last breath of this body. While all that is okay in its place, is it possible for us to have a deeper understanding which overrides the ordinary understanding. I lose some money and the ordinary understanding is, oh my, what a bad day. And I lost so much of money today. And there are two problems. Now, one is I lost money. Another is if my husband comes to know I lost 10,000 rupees uh, being a little careless. For next 10 days, he will continuously say, I told you, you have to be more careful. Now, more than 10,000 that I lost, this husband nagging me for next 10 days and maybe telling even our relatives and friends, my wife these days has become very absent-minded, etc., etc. I can't bear that. So, you know, that is uh, one level. But if you have studied Vedanta, if you have lived certain values that support the Vedantic understanding, then you will take a deep breath and say, hold on. This is once more the play of the mind, mischief of the mind. I will find out a way to deal with my husband. And I will also find out the best possible way to deal with this loss of 10,000 rupees. Maybe I should complain. Maybe put a police complaint. And maybe if nothing can be done, forget it. Move on. So, there are things that can be done and one does it. That is practical life. But underneath it, if there is an understanding that the mind plays its games, thoughts come and thoughts go. Thoughts that put me on a high pedestal rise in life, they don't stay. Thoughts that throw me on the ground, rise in our minds. They don't stay. Either way, I don't want to be a puppet in the hands of these thoughts. I want to be awareness. I want to be consciousness. I want to be that alert, vigilant principle where the, the, the play of the mind finds its place. I don't want to unduly empower my own mind. The mind, after all, is a tool. The body, after all, is like a vehicle in which we are traveling. Like a man riding a horse. is not the horse. At the right time, he gets down. And the horse also rests. He sits, he rests in another place. The rider upon the horse and the horse are different. Like that, you and I need to have increased understanding of the spirit that you and I are. In this context, 
Bhagavad Gita also talks about happiness. In the chapter 6, which is popularly known as Dhyana Yoga, another name for it is Atma Sanyama Yoga. In that sixth chapter, where much guidance is given on meditation, we have Sri Krishna giving an amazing, unusual definition of yoga. Here, yoga is to be understood more in a general sense, a high level of spirituality. Yoga, as you know, yoga is union with the divinity. Yoga is union with the divine, which can happen through bhakti or yoga or karma or jnana. Therefore, yoga means the high plateau of spiritual excellence. For that, Sri Krishna gives an interesting definition. Tam vidya dukkha sanyoga viyogam yoga sanditam sanishchayena yoktavyaha yoga anirvinna chetasa. Chapter 6. That practice has to be taken up without falling for some wave of some intrusion of uh, dip, you know, depression or sadness. We tend to sometimes give up too early. There are times when we should give up when really we are extremely tired. But many a time we give up too early. That we should not. Anirvinna chetasa. And what's the definition of yoga that Bhagavan Sri Krishna gives? Tam vidyat. Know that to be yoga. Know that to be yoga. Dukkha sanyoga viyogam. That is the definition. <laughs> Very interesting. Yoga, which is coming together, joining, Sri Krishna says, is essentially viyoga. Viyogam yogam vidyat. He says, how can Vyoga be Yoga? They are, are they not opposed to each other? Sri Krishna, you can imagine a mischievous smile on his face as he was saying this to Arjuna. Vyoga is Yoga. Separation is union. How? How can separation be union? The full compound, Samasa. Dukkha Sanyoga Vyoga. In our ignorance, in our erroneous perception, in our flawed paradigm, our paradigm is flawed. There is a flaw. In the flawed paradigm, you know, we are into Dukkha. We have made contact with Dukkha. Otherwise, we were wonderful. We were very happy. But we saw a situation wrongly. And we were agitated. Dukkha Sanyoga happened because of a false paradigm. Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks extensively on paradigm. Today, his son and grandson run a podcast that is called The Paradigm Shift. Last night during my walk, I was hearing you know, his grandson and his son are talking. Shivan Kovi, the famous author, you know, died in 2002. So they talk about paradigm. And they quote, I had not read it, but they quote their grandfather. Shivan Kovi himself, it seems, was once traveling by a bus. And then somebody got into the bus with some seven children. Seven children. Small children. And they were running around the bus. And the man was sitting quietly who had brought those seven children. And these seven children were actually disturbing everybody. They were even pulling some somebody's newspaper. They were even touching somebody who was trying to have some quiet time. And Mr. Stephen Covey got very disturbed. He said, this is nonsense. And look at this man, so irresponsible. He brings seven boys inside the house, inside the bus. And all of us, other passengers, are put to trouble. And he just looks at the ceiling, not doing anything about disciplining these boys. And then Mr. Covey goes to that man after some time, unable to bear the annoyance, says, My friend, you brought all these boys. 
Can you not see how much disturbance they are causing in the bus? Even as the bus is moving, that man looked at Kobe and said, Oh, oh sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know what happened is, I'm just uh, going with these children to my main house. My mother passed away this morning at 8 a.m. And I am full of thoughts of my mother, how I could not be by her side when she died. And uh, I'm eager to go there. So, so much filled with thoughts of my mother. I'm sorry, I did not notice. I will do my best and so on. Kobe, I believe in his book, maybe in the main book I have forgotten, although I had read it fully, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In that, he gives this as a paradigm shift. A moment ago, he saw the situation as nothing but seven kids going uh, amok, going bazaar, and the man who brought them doing nothing. That is the paradigm. That is how he saw the situation. Now, once this new information came, this man lost his mother two hours ago, and he is going towards the house where his mother breathed her last. Immediately, the perception changed. In that way, you and I can change our perception by inquiring. It is one notch above ordinary self-improvement. You learn some new skills, you learn some new language, you learn, you know, you equip yourself with some new techniques and so on. But paradigm shift is when you see differently. You see the world differently. And in the Vedanta, especially in the Ramana Maharshi version of the Vedanta, you see yourself differently. That doesn't happen just like that. You need to quietly look at yourself, question your paradigm, question next time you feel I think I am such a uh, such a miserable person. My life has gone gone waste. Some some such thought comes. Question that. Hold on. Why is this thought rising like this? This has been this thought has been coming. It's not not new, and so on. So in a certain paradigm about how you see yourself. You know, there is Dukkha Sanyoga. You then embrace sorrow. Inquire. Give to yourself a little time. Don't uh, encourage the mind to go into just noise. Random noise. Treat your mind with a certain friendly spirit. Tell your mind, oh dear mind, hold on. Let us look at this scenario with some fresh eyes. So let the mind calm down. To make the mind calm down, do some yoga, do some asana, do some pranayama, do some spending time in some natural surrounding. I have a friend when I go to Bangalore, you know, he takes me out for a walk in the morning. And sorry to say, even in good areas like J.P. Nagar, etc., that's where we walked last time. Oh my God. You go into some crossroad, early morning especially, 6.30, huge heaps of garbage are there. From a distance, you have to hold your thing. So I was thinking, next time I'm going again to Bangalore, end of this month. Next time I want to tell my friend, I'm not coming with you to this walking by the roads, this road and that road and then well, everywhere here and there, traffic, heap of uh, garbage, which perhaps, yeah, and they get they clear it at about 7, 7.30, some van comes and some truck comes and removes it. Bangalore, South Bangalore has so many beautiful parks. I'm going to insist with that friend. We are going to a very nice park, inside the park. And we'll walk there. And not on this roadside. Bangalore, whom, which we love otherwise, it's a beautiful city for a lot of good reasons. But alas, at places 
the garbage disposal and stray dogs and all those things are not handled properly. So coming back, spend time amidst nature between trees and in the midst of trees, I mean. So what happens is you will be able to see how the present paradigm, the way you see yourself, the way you see your family, your organization, it is a way of seeing paradigm. That paradigm shifts. You see people whom a while ago, uh, you know, you thought were a nuisance. Suddenly in the new paradigm, no. Oh, these five or six people in my office, though they, they have been a bit funny, they have a lot of potential in them. They can be great assets. I need to approach them in a proper way. And you begin to see the potential, how they can be assets rather than a liability. Paradigm shift. Anyway, coming back to Bhagavad Gita and how Lord Sri Krishna puts it, we get into this Dukkha Sanyoga. It is like lifting a hot brick. And only way to be free of pain is drop it. That is Vyoga. There is Dukkha Sanyoga. Now, what is required is Vyoga of that. Your embrace with sorrow, Dukkha, has to be withdrawn. Don't embrace sorrow. You have clung, you have held, uh, held sorrow tightly in your arms. Take your arms off. That is Dukkha Sanyoga Vyoga. Tam Vidya Dukkha Sanyoga Vyogam Yoga Sanditam. That is what Rishis call Yoga. Rishis call that Yoga where there is a Vyoga from Dukkha Sanyoga. What a wonderful intelligent definition. Likewise, we have Gita, Upanishads, throwing light. Then you and I realize. Therefore, we need to be a little slow in taking disciplines. Not every time for the sake of slowing down, but wherever we see a possibility that I could be wrong, then wait a little. Check again. Because wrong decisions can lead to a lot of sorrow to us. Anyway, coming to again in Upanishad, let me quote for you Katopanishad. In Katopanishad, there are two mantras which talk of Sukha and Shanti. Katopanishad has two chapters. Each has three vallis. So I am talking of the second chapter and second valli. That means out of the six, fifth valli, you have two mantras which are 12 and 13 to give the numbers. They are very poetic, very beautiful in their construction. One talks about Shashvatam Sukham. How are we to get everlasting Sukha, joy, happiness? Another talks about Shanti, that is peace. So call it Shanti, call it uh, Sukha. So let me read them. One says, Eko Vashi Sarva Bhutantaratma Ekam Rupam Bahudhayak Paroti Tamatmastam Yenu Pashyanti Dhira Esham Sukham Shashvatam Na Itaresham Others do not get this lasting happiness. Only they get. Who are they? Who see the one in the many. Who see the one controlling principle in this manifold creation. And what is more, in both the mantras, this expression comes. Tam Atmastam Pashyanti. They see that truth not far away in some Brahmaloka or Swarga or somewhere. That truth is within oneself. Atmastam. Esham sukam na itaresham. Then the second mantra. Nityaha anityanam chetanaha chetananam eko bahunam yo vidadhati kaman 
तम आत्मस्तम ये पश्य धीरा शांति ही शाश्वती इम्पेबल एमिस्ट दिशिंग ऑन सर्फेस थिंग्स आर डाइंग बट बीनीथ द सर्फेस इफ यू हैव द आईज टू सी there is something imperishable even in the midst of inner stuff there is something principle of life which can make those inner things come back to life people are moving the body by itself is achetana but because there is chetana in them the achetana sharira becomes chetana van or chaitanya van so the two mantras saying tesham sukham na itaresham not of others tesham shanti na itaresham both talk about a certain ability to behold ability to see in oneself and by extension in everyone certain divine spark now this may look a little mystical let me Dwell a little on it, and I take the help of Taittiriya Upanishad, the Mahananda Valli, to which we made several references yesterday too. Even in the synopsis that went with the announcement of these talks, had a statement that the true nature of everybody is bliss, Raso Vai Saha. That is also from Taittiriya Upanishad, the Mahananda Valli. Raso Yam Raso Bis Saha. रसम लब्धवा आनंदी रसा मीन्स ब्लिस रसो वही सह आत्मा इन एवरीबडी इन यू एंड मी इज ऑफ द नेचर ऑफ ब्लिस बट नाउ आई एम कमिंग टू ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट और लाइन फ्रॉम तैत्रे उपनिषद द सेकेंड वर्ली वेन इट इज सैड वेन अवर माइंड मेक्स इवन द लीस्ट डिफरेंस भेद बिटवीन दि सो कॉल अदर्स एंड अवर से उदरमंतर कुरुते अथ तस्वती उदरम मीन वेरी लिटल उदरम हियर हेज नथिंग टू डू विद अवर वेली उदर कैन मीन यू नो अवर स्टमक यू नो पुरंदर दास संग सॉ उदर वैराग्य विदु ನಮ್ಮ ಪದುಮನಾಭನಲ್ಲಿ ಲೇಷ ಬಹುತಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಸಮ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಸೇ ವಿಷ್ಣು ವಿಷ್ಣು ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಹರಿ ಹರಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಶೋ ದೆಮ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಟು ಬಿ ವಿರಾಗಿ ವೆರಿ ಅನ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಡ್ ಬಟ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ದೇ ಡೂ ಆಲ್ ದಟ್ ಶೋ ಫಾರ್ ಉದರ ಟು ಫಿಲ್ ದೇರ್ ಬೆಲಿ ಟು ಫಿಲ್ ದೇರ್ ಸ್ಟಮ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ರಿಯಲ್ ವೈರಾಗ್ಯ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಉದರ ವೈರಾಗ್ಯ ದೇರ್ ಉದರ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಟಮ but here ut and aram is very less tiny the least difference between others and us others are not really others on a deeper level that is the teaching you know look at your sorrow next time you are in a sorrowful mood sorrowful mood you look at it you find that for 10% of some physical discomfort it is 90% psychological situation i have a smaller house than the houses that my four brothers have i have a smaller house and all my four brothers are having bigger house yes a smaller house does cause some physical discomfort where to keep things no space left and so on but you know psychological component is look i am the eldest and what is the use of being eldest look i am actually more qualified also i did phd they just did some diploma course in information technology and they all made money in modern it times so many ways comparison is set in motion and 
there is a labeling of oneself. I have made a fool of myself. I need not have done PhD in English literature. Instead, after my 12th grade itself, I should have done a couple of computer courses and Infosys, Wipro, there are so many other companies. Some job, I have heard that even people who are serving tea every afternoon or morning 11 a.m. at Infosys got so much stock options and became millionaires. Whereas I am a PhD and I teach at own junior college, I am, see, mind goes berserk. Mind, psychological stuff, right? So please see, now the Upanishad comes in here. I am an unfortunate, unlucky fellow. My four younger brothers are so lucky. They took the right decisions. They and me, me and they. Who is doing this? The mind. As Maharshi Ramana said, I quoted from Sadarshanam, Sarvottama aham mati shunya nishta. There's another expression over there. Nir niraham pratiti. Aham pratiti, aham pratyaya is I as separate from others. Vedanta is very clear on this. Vedanta, meaning Upanishads, are very clear that it is thought which is the mischief maker. Even if factual, physical things are valid, you must concern yourself with what you may do and not go on creating these images. Mind is an image maker. Mind goes on creating images. And if 9 out of 10 images are negative, the description contained in that image, you know, mind creates an image. I ask myself, who am I? And the mind says, you are the person who lost in every game you played. That's an image, you know. So, in financial, health-wise, or some other, in number of ways, the mind is capable of creating unpleasant images or pleasant images. And those of us who are spiritually immature, not only create unpleasant images, self-images about ourselves, but we stay in them. We remain stuck in a negative self-image. Maharshi Ramana, the great sages of the Vedanta would say, be free of images, unless warranted. Somewhere in a certain situation, somebody asks, what's your uh, citizenship? Then you need to say, well, I have been living in the United States for 15 years, but I am still Indian citizen. I am an Indian citizen. I live in USA. I have... This is image. Somebody asked, therefore you said. But if you are sitting in a park, nobody is asking you any question. You are looking at a nice pond on which some ducks are swimming and there are some flowers in bloom also. Weather is pleasant. Fresh, nice breeze is, in the, is around. So, why should you say I am an Indian citizen? I should have become a US citizen. Uh, on another side of my mind says I should not have migrated at all. Mysore was so good. Hyderabad was so nice. I could have stayed in one of those places. Mind is noisy. For heaven's sake, be aware of the images that the mind is creating. When images rise, then the division between others and us becomes wide. When your mind is silent, brothers, the brothers who have big house and you who has a small house, the brothers who earn more, you who earns less, all that is not an issue at all. All that doesn't come in the way of happiness. Happiness, therefore, is not a matter of stilling the mind with a drug or some other thing. 
it is a matter of arriving at inner silence out of spiritual maturity. Upanishads can give you that spiritual maturity. Therefore, by learning to be alert, be vigilant, learning to watch the movement of the self, as J. Krishnamurti would put it, so learning to watch the movement of the self, movement of thought, learning to watch whatever is happening, standing apart from them, not going to sleep, but being alert. It's a tight rope walk. We either go to sleep when we try to watch our thoughts or we hug our thoughts so tightly and the thoughts then take us on a roller coaster ride. So, is it possible for us neither to cling to thoughts, identify with thoughts, take an image as real, unquestionably true, that's one extreme, nor go to sleep and not notice at all what is happening. Can you be attentive? That is Sakshi Bhava in the Vedanta. Higher Vedanta prescribes Sakshi Bhava. You be the witness of thoughts, neither getting into them nor running away from them. In this way, the mantras of the Upanishads, which then echo in the Gita, in Prakarana Granthas like Viveka Chodamani or Sadarshan and so on, these insights actually can bring to us an inner transformation. And we can be more dynamic, we can do whatever we are doing more effectively when there is a certain inner peace. Please never imagine that Vedanta will make us move away, walk away. Vivekananda, Chinmayananda and so on were great Vedantins and they were so dynamic. They worked so hard. They laughed, they smiled, they showed compassion to suffering people. They lived a vibrant, full life. And Vedanta did not come in the way. And I don't have to give examples of sannyasis only. There are so many householders, so many men and women who also, thanks to their satsangas, study, meditation, reflection, etc., sometimes sannyasis and swamis look at these householders and say, my God, we have to learn from them. This volunteer, this secretary, this treasurer, this gentleman, this lady who is working for this ashram is, you know, in spite of her being a householder, mother of three children, etc. She does so much with a smile on her face. And I sit on a pedestal and teach some scriptures. I don't have the kind of cheerfulness that she seems to exude. We realize. Therefore, don't have narrow ideas that some sannyasis can be at peace, etc. Sannyasi, married, etc. are all superficial. Whether you are householder or a sannyasi, what finally matters is how alert you are in daily life, how balanced you are, and it can be obtained, it can be acquired. You can be you can acquire that quality of attention no matter what your position in the society and in the family is. Let me pause here. I compliment Indika Moksha for putting together such programs. May everybody and may more and more people benefit from this. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva. Thank you very much, uh, Swamiji. Uh, for a wonderful concluding session, for a wonderful discussion. I think uh, especially the assurance at the end that the peace is something, I mean, while it is easier said than done, while all things taken into account, it is possible for even a grihastha, it is possible for everyone to attain some, some magnitude of peace, if not the, you know, absolute anandam, at least to some degree of mental peace and contentment is for possible for everybody. 
so i i think we began the discussion with the statement that uh, happiness is the goal of life ultimately everybody wants that and uh, it's it's assurance uh, towards the end that it is possible to attain that for everybody it's not only for uh, uh, for example uh, renunciate uh, sanyasi or somebody who is purely doing uh, focusing on spirituality but even all all of us who are in the midst of the world who have all this responsibility who have all this desires attachment but still even we can you know uh, find peace amidst these disturbances i think uh, this is the great take away message uh, uh, for me and i request viewers to uh, send questions in q and a box and we have some time so if there are any questions swamji will take them up uh, swamji one questions we have received now uh, it is that uh, to think that i am not living for an image is also an image only isn't it so is ego synonymous with image product uh, image projection uh if we think i am not living for an image that also is an image therefore it's not so much about thinking or saying to oneself i don't want to be for an image i am not here to impress people i don't care what the society thinks of me those words and then that kind of thinking will not take us far rather than thinking like that you know though that thinking might be you know a starting point very soon more than thinking like that or saying to somebody i don't care for what people think of me we actually should arrive at you know that state where we do not depend upon how people think about us therefore the focus is not about words not about thoughts but about directly understanding directly watching so do some pranayama do some regulated breathing then you will be able to see thoughts do not introduce any thought do not initiate any thought thoughts will arise on their own look at them and when you look at them quietly you will see that they are so mechanical those thoughts are nothing but some conditioning the thoughts are nothing but some influence you know they don't have their own intrinsic worth somebody said and it is disturbing me so it's just his opinion so i'm describing it using words but in actual observation of the movement of the self we don't use words thought may have words certain agitation arises in me and it may have words but i who am observing that agitation on my part do not introduce words therefore vimla takar and others have spoken of this a non verbal you know encounter with thought a non verbal we don't verbalize we are not cricket commentators who go on saying something as the players run from one end to other and so on you know that is a commentator's job is different here we are silent spectators but intelligence is operating there is also this expression intelligence beyond mind intelligence beyond without words we are so used to operation of intelligence with words because so in so many other subjects the operation of intelligence in no time comes out with words but in the self inquiry self observation self awareness self realization and all that the operation of the intelligence is without any words on your part a thought that is rising may have its words that's very different therefore ego is synonymous with the image projection definitely ego is a bundle of images but let the ego be there don't have a fight with the ego but notice the ego be aware of the ego a vulgar ego a bad ego or a pleasant ego a, a ego that wants to help the society whatever good or bad be aware of it and in this quiet moments the the ego undergoes a change yeah 
thank you swamiji uh, another question we have received is uh, please co comment on is the psychological part uh, what shri krishna murti j krishna murti teachings is same as second arrow that was talked by buddha correct yeah uh, precisely the psychological aspect that shri j krishna murti talks a lot is nothing but the second arrow the reference is Somebody had uh, uh, come to the Buddha and was complaining how his life had become so sorrowful. And the Buddha says, you know, suppose an arrow hits you, will you, uh, will you look for a second arrow? Will you wait for a second arrow? What will you do? The man says, so oh, one arrow already is causing me so much pain. Who wants a second arrow? I will concern myself with removing the first arrow that has hit my arm. Then the Buddha says, yeah, that being an analogy in your life, you seem to be uh, welcoming and uh, exposing your arm for the other person to hit one more arrow. Second arrow refers to the psychological dimension. One thing is what has actually happened. Another is blaming others or blaming oneself. We blame ourselves. We generate a number of associated thoughts you know, which only muddle up the situation more. So that is psychological component. I put my foot upon a banana skin and fall and uh, it pains. Of course, some leg pain is there. That is first arrow. As I get up, I notice that three people with their mobiles took photograph already. Then I start worrying, what if one of them is a journalist? Or even without being a journalist, all of them have Facebook accounts. Tomorrow my picture slipping and falling will be... I go on worrying. Right? This is all second arrow. Even if that prospect comes before your mind, deal with it with minimum amount of you know, imagining, etc. So yes, uh, uh, the proposal that the psychological dimension is akin to the second arrow in the Buddha's uh, illustrative story is, is true. Uh, thank you, Swamiji. Uh, we have one or two more questions. Uh, one is, uh, is being good and doing good sincerely alone in itself, can it be a path uh, devoid of any other spiritual practices can, it, can this alone be a path for happiness and moksha? The answer is both yes and no. Yes, because if you and I are able to daily do good things, serve others and uh, live a moral life, it is enough. Yes. But no, because it is not possible to live a good life, a morally sound life, a life which is marked by service to others and so on. It's not possible unless we practice certain uh, spiritual exercises. Some do it by prayer, meditation and so on. Some do yoga asana and so on. Some who are more intellectual study, reflect. Because the ground reality of our life is, though we don't want to be unkind to somebody, at the spur of the moment we lose our temper and say something to somebody, our own father or mother, our own, you know, very near and dear ones. And then we regret. This is how life goes on generally. There is hardly anyone who can succeed uh, in living, you know, being good and doing good. It's easier said than done. 999 out of 1,000 people want to be good, want to do good, but they cannot. You know, then, then they regret, right? So to, to enable ourselves to be good and to do good, certain spiritual practices are required. If not anything else, J. Krishnamurti and such people did not prescribe any japa, tapa, puja, etc. But they talked of a spiritual practice of a very high level. They said, be very, very self-observant observation, watching and constantly being on vigil, how your mind is operating. That was their teaching. That is more difficult than puja or japa. So apparently they give you a very a lot of freedom 
don't do any sadhana, they say. But they are actually prescribing a harder sadhana to be constantly aware of things outside and inside. Therefore, the answer is to be good and to do good is the essence of spirituality. But in order that we may be good and we may do good, generally we need certain exercises, exposure, satsang, meeting some pious people from whom we pick up something and then we take a new direction and so on. All right. Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, so another question is, um, I have started developing, uh, started experiencing Vairagya to do due to continuous uh, study of Vedanta. But at another level, my concern is that uh, nothing is uh, nothing is uh, interesting or exciting anymore. I find myself difficult to engage with the worldly work. Yes, all of us go through this. Uh, that is because our Vedantic study has been a bit compartmentalized. You and I need to make our Vedanta study connect with daily life uh, by a little more of homework. Because Vedanta does two things. One is it describes you know, a, a state of uh, happiness, state of inner freedom and so on. We like it. But we, uh, the second thing Vedanta does is, it actually throws light on the negativities that arise in daily life. Now, if we are only carried away by the beautiful descriptions of, uh, you know, uh, a renunciant life, and uh, we haven't worked, we haven't uh, exercised our mind, our intelligence, in understanding how we are living actually, then there, this problem arises. So, uh, I'm glad you asked this. Suppose any of us, you, me or anybody, finds uh, our work or certain relationships so boring. We don't want to spend time with these two people or those two you know, relatives. Then, we have to actually question. We have to, that's where Krishnamurti and others have thrown very precious light. What is making me uh, lose interest in talking to my cousin and so on. You know. Maybe something he made an unpleasant comment about me, he criticized my spirituality, maybe he talked negatively about my going to Vedanta classes, find out, maybe, or something else. So by examining, by examining why we lose interest, we'll find that there is some hurt of ego. There is some ragadvesha because of that. That is, see, I may dislike some work uh, because I don't get praised for that work. If somebody were to come and compliment me once in a while, I will work with great interest. Right? Then I notice as a Vedanta student, you know, I notice that, hey, Gita is talking about ragadvesha. Uh, attachment and aversion. I think I am very attached to praise because nobody is praising me. My boss uh, uh, hardly comes and looks at what I am doing. Uh, therefore, I am finding the work very boring. Imagine if my boss were to come once a week and look at my work and, hey, that's good work. Keep it up and give a pat on my back. I would have found the work interesting. So, I will just give one or two examples. No work will be boring, no work will be monotonous if certain negativities were not in our bosom. We need to detect the negativities. It could be a wanting praise, it could be certain you know, anger at some insult thrown at us. So I was working somewhere and then somebody made a nasty comment about me. I don't want to go there anymore. <laughs> it's not the work, but some nasty comment somebody made mm -hmm. in front of me or behind me. Or maybe sometimes misreported. He never said that. But some mischief maker said, you know, you went there, that, that person said like this about you. Hearing that and believing that, uh, we, we become, we lose our motivation. If that is what uh, they talk about me, 
I don't think I want to do. I don't want to go there anymore. Therefore, my suggestion is uh, we, uh, we need to find out is there something else involved on the psychological level? Some hurt, some kind of feeling isolated and you will find it. And once that is exposed, it is like throwing a dead rat far away from an apartment where some foul smell was coming. Found the dead rat, it it by the tail and threw it far away. Like that. So true Thank Vedanta you. will not cause this uh, lack of interest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji, uh, for the wonderful responses. And I think, uh, you know, many of these questions come from a practical perspective and uh, your clarifications are very, very helpful to Vedanta Sadakas. And uh, mm. especially, I think you made a very important point mm. about how Vedanta studies have been very compart uh, compartmentalized today and that is mm. uh, problematic in some way because on one hand, we are living a day-to-day -day life where we have desires mm. We have attachments. We are affected by the Arishad Vargas, the Kama, Krodha, Loba, everything. And on the other way, on the other hand, we are listening to teachers teaching about Brahman, teaching about reality, teaching about Jagan Mithyatva, the Brahma Sat Satyatva. And mm -hmm. somehow we are unable to make the connection where, 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 how to, how to connect them. So I think uh, your clarifications uh, are very helpful. Perhaps we could do some talk in the future, purely focusing on this, you know, the bridging this gap uh, between, uh, because ultimately Vedanta is not about theoretical understanding. Now, now it is only theoretical understanding, therefore the Arishad Varga still remains. So yeah. only when the, the gap is bridged, the theoretical understanding begins to transform into uh, a more realistic, uh, uh, you know, more... Uh, uh, you know, take us on the path towards Aparokshanabhuti eventually. Mm -hmm. So, I am very thankful to you, Swamiji, uh, for, coming, uh, for coming on these talks and look forward to doing more sessions with you in the future. And um, I, I don't see any more questions. Uh, uh, so, uh, we will uh, conclude the session today. And uh, I thank you on behalf of all uh, our team and all our viewers for taking your time for doing this session. Thank you very much, Swamiji. Namaste. Namaste. Uh, viewers, uh, the recordings of the sessions will be published on our channel, YouTube channel. Uh, you can type in Advaita Academy in YouTube and mm -hmm. you'll get all our videos, mm -hmm. not just the live sessions, but many, we regularly upload Vedanta classes of various texts, various lectures and everything. So you can uh, watch them. And the recordings of these sessions will be uploaded very soon in a few uh, a few days. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter uh, for updates about our upcoming programs. Uh, so with this, uh, we conclude the session. Shri Guru Bhyo Namah.